Thank you, Predrag. Thank you very much. Um, I suspect that when you alluded to me so kindly as like following the Rolling Stones, what you meant was that I was aging and past my best. <laughs> but I'll try to give you some satisfaction today. Um, I do realise that people may be keen to go to Stephen Laurier's lecture, and I will be more than happy for you to leave at the time. I shan't be in the least offended. If you wish, I shall turn my back as you do leave. Um, I shall look out for the signal when I should stop. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me and for your hospitality. Um, it's wonderful to visit, and I'm not just grateful. I feel very honoured, actually, to, to be at this institution um, and to be allowed to present some data and thoughts. Um, I'm in a place I know that has contributed enormously to our understanding of mental illness and is continuing in, to contribute to that and indeed to our understanding of the mind in general. So thank you very much. I'm going to present uh, my talk really with two problems in mind when thinking about the neurobiology of um, mental illness and particularly delusions. Um, those two problems are not ones that I can possibly solve here, but I'd like to just n let you know that I bear them in mind as I continue my work. And the first of the problems is this, that when we have somebody who has a delusional belief, for example, in this case, the belief that the television is talking about me, a delusion of reference, um, we may be able to find bizarre patterns of brain activity associated with that, or unusual or changed patterns, but there does seem to be an explanatory gap between the brain observation and the phenomenology or the experience of the delusion itself. It's not clear prima facie why a change in activity in a particular region, let's say ventral striatum, constitutes an abnormal belief. And I think we have to work very hard at trying to translate from the objective, um, reliable measures of the brain to the more subjective, high-level, complex experiences. And that's one problem, the problem of what's been referred to as consilience. But in addition, we have to remember that the brain is an integrative and adaptive organ that is dealing with both its beliefs and the world in general. And there are a number of ambiguous, um, or there is an ambiguity essentially about a brain observation in the context of a delusion. This has been referred to by David Lewis as beware of the three C's. And I'll explain what that means. Essentially, one possibility is that, um, I'm not sure if this, is this the pointer? Um, okay. One possibility is that this region of the brain is the cause of the delusion, but another possibility is that it's the consequence of the delusion. Yet another possibility is that it has nothing to do directly with the delusional belief itself, but that in this strange relationship between the external reality and the internal inference, the brain is compensating for that experience. So it can be a cause, a consequence, or a compensation for the um, for the uh, psychopathology under study. And this actually appeals to a broader uh, argument that's gone on in psychiatry that's ebbed and flowed, and I don't really have time to go into it now, but it, I can caricature it slightly by suggesting that some people, including from the start Maher and others, have suggested that the real problem in the delusion is that people have abnormal sensory experiences and that their ability or their, their inference about those experiences is actually relatively preserved but they are drawing strange conclusions because the experiences, is, experiences are unusual. Others have suggested actually the experiences themselves are normal, but the inferences or the inference system is abnormal. So attributional theorists, people like Richard Bentle in the UK and the in people at the Institute of Psychiatry like Philippa Garrity have suggested really it's all about abnormal inferential processing in the context of normal um, normal experience. Max Coulthart, on the other hand, has suggested that actually uh, the only way you can really explain delusions is to invoke two factors, an abnormal sensation, which explains the content, and an abnormal inference, which explains why you hold the belief. I'd like to suggest in this talk that actually we really need to think about the interaction between the inference and the perception, and indeed maybe to do away with that dichotomy. This is what I'm aiming to say. I'd like to begin by acknowledging, although I won't make this explicit in the talk, that cognitive neuroscience, as it employs a vocabulary and a, and a sort of approach that embodies uh, several layers of description from the basic neuronal processing, computation, information processing, through to psychological constructs and high-level experiences, may be a very useful field in which to explore 
uh, delusion. And I think the big advances, advances in cognitive neuroscience have really carried psychiatry uh, further than it would have gone without cognitive neuroscience. A starting point is I think we need to consider what we can say about the normal inference processes in the brain. In fact, a lot of this has just been said by Predrag, and uh, I hope I'm not going over old ground. I'd like to make two points. One is that what we already know influences what we perceive. I think this notion that perception and infer inference are different is, is wrong. A perception is an inference, and that's one point I want to make and give some examples. I'd like to also suggest that... Um, Prediction error is a very important signal that drives changes in inference. So a system would be rather robust but inflexible if all it did was saw what it expected to see in the world. So there needs to be some mechanism by which it can change its, um, its inferences. And this leads on to the idea that the brain may function as a Bayesian inference machine. This is uh, very much the mode at the moment, and I'm, one should always be aware of modish views. But I do think that Bayesian... Uh, theories do capture a lot of what we see in the, in the way people behave in psychological tests. So in short, I'm going to say that perception and inference are not separate or separable. I'm going to say that when prediction error is low, what we know modifies what we perceive. When prediction error is high, what we perceive modifies what we know. And finally, I think that a disruption in prediction error may, may provide a useful heuristic or framework for thinking about delusional beliefs. I'm going to then show some data, and I'm some of this is really um, very much work in progress. I, I've uh, chosen to present some data that has already been published, but also the latest data from some ketamine work that we've been, do we've been doing on healthy humans. And I hope that will uh, um, help to unpack the model a bit. So to begin with, um, we seem to live in a world in which there are things that cause our sensations. Now, it's rendered slightly complex by the fact that not everything out there will cause a sensation, and in fact, not, of all, not all of our sensations are caused by things out there. On top of that, we do not have direct access to their causes. Our senses are noisy. Helmholtz, Holtz, in a wonderful treatise in 1878 called um, Facts of Perception, suggested that our sensations are not images of the world in any way. They're signs. Uh, vague signs that something out there has happened and the most that we can hope for them is that they are consistent so when the same thing happens again we get the same sign. So we have a fundamental problem, we're in a mist um, of noisy senses and we don't have direct access to causes and yet we need access to that because we will be successful if we can predict the world. If um, we know what's going to reward us and we know what's going to punish us we can head towards one and avoid the other and that's pretty much what we can hope for in life. That wasn't a philosophical point, it's just a general idea. We, we like rewards and we don't like punishments, most of us. So what is the problem? The problem is inferring causes from noisy sense data. And of course that is a problem that's dealt with by Bayesian systems. And I just want to pause for a moment because a, a Bayesian idea is simply that we represent a belief. In this case, the idea that a given sense that we have had has produced a certain cause. Or in other words, the probability that given this sense, this was the cause, we represent that belief as a conditional probability distribution function. We don't represent it as an all or nothing thing. And according to Bayes' theorem, this will be proportional to the probability that that cause would indeed lead to that sensation, which is fairly self-explanatory. If it w wasn't likely to lead to that sensation, then why would we entertain the idea that that sense was produced by that cause? But also times the prior probability that that cause is indeed out there. If we hear hoof taps, it's probably, or actually a better analogy would be, if we see paw prints in the snow, it's probably safer to assume it was a dog than it's, it's, it's a cheetah if we're in the middle of Stockholm. You know, the prior probability of cheetah is smaller, at least I think it is, 